This is a sermon from Cornerstone Church in Kingston. We're delighted to make these resources available for you and hope that you enjoy the ministry of God's Word today. There are lots of other resources on our website which we are pleased to make available and you can browse our website and download sermons and podcasts, read blogs and articles. And if you've been listening for a while and you would like to get to know the church or for us to get to know you a bit, there is an e-contact card, a welcome card that you can fill in on our website and we'd love to hear from you. And can you uh, grab your Bibles and turn with me to the book of John? And we're going to be looking at John chapter 11, starting at verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stays at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is, who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odour, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus. Come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth round his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Pete. Well, it's a remarkable passage, a well-known passage, remarkable passage. There are verses in there uh, that it's traditional in this country uh, to read at, at every funeral, and uh, they're, they're often read and spoken on at, at, um, at lots and lots and lots and lots of funerals. But let's pray. 
Father, help us now. This is an amazing passage written for our benefit, written that we may believe. It's written that uh, we may actually come to the Messiah ourselves and know resurrection life in him. And uh, we ask you, please, as we look at it, we can't, there's so many things in it, we can't look at everything. But as we skim through this passage, you would, you would do your work that the word of Jesus would come into our hearts here and open up the grave and call us out, that we may be born into the kingdom of God, we pray. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, well, there's a, there's a city in Surrey. It's about, it's about 15 miles away from here. And it's quite, it's quite interesting because... I'd never heard of it until uh, a little while ago. Well, I'd sort of heard of it, but I didn't really know anything about it. And I think lots of people have actually never heard of it, or or they just don't realise it's a city. Uh, And and that's that's sort of what goes on. It has actually a quarter of a million residents. Um, uh, Many have uh, moved from London, because it's overcrowded London, into this city, so they'll be surrounded by the beautiful... Surrey uh, countryside, amongst the residents of some very, very famous people. The entrance of this city is very impressive if you've been to it. It's an avenue of redwood trees, and you, you come into it that way. There are lots of listed buildings uh, in this city, uh, lots of different quarters and areas. Uh, it's, it's beautifully laid out with boulevards and avenues and roads, and uh, there are lots of woods, there's lots of lawns. Uh, it even has its own lake, and it has one station now. It used to have two, two uh, railway stations to it. Um, it was so popular. It's very beautiful, and it's very quiet, and it's a bit like a paradise city. I think most of us would want to live there, but you can imagine it costs. It's in the Surrey con- countryside. It costs. And uh, sort of looking at you, I'm not sure. It would cost you everything if you want to go and live in this place. It's called Brookwood. Ever heard of it? It used to be called London's Necropolis. Now, a necropolis means city of the dead. It's a cemetery. London's Necropolis. Like you get Metropolis, Necropolis. That's what it used to be called. Brookwood, London's Necropolis. And it used to be the largest necropolis or cemetery in the world. It's now sort of not that. It's the largest in Britain and one of the biggest in Europe. It was created because there were so many dead people in London, the graveyards were full, and so they had to move them out to Surrey, Brookwood. It's just down from Guildford, London Necropolis. Originally, it had a dedicated uh, railway line. Next to Waterloo was the London Necropolis station. And it went direct from Waterloo, direct to London Necropolis, Brookwood. It was amazing. A branch line that went straight there. Uh, And there were two stations in the cemetery. There was a north station and a south station. The north station was for nonconformists. The South Station was for Anglicans. Isn't that amazing? They had to go a little bit further. The Anglicans, that's what happens, isn't it? Living passengers were charged six shillings to go first class, three shillings and sixpence to go second class, two shillings to go third class, uh, and that's obviously for a return ticket. The dead passengers were charged one pound for first class, five shillings for second class, and two shillings and sixpence for third class, one way. (laughs) Here's a picture of a ticket. There's a third class ticket, coffin ticket, Waterloo to Brookwood, (laughs) London Necropolis. It's there, it's amazing, it's worth going around. We went around it in uh, in lockdown, (laughs) uh, because it was something to do. Um, But it is amazing. (laughs) It, it has different areas for different faiths. We've already seen there's an Anglican. It's lovely how they separate those two. There's an Anglican thing miles away from the nonconformists. Uh, it has an Islamic site uh, added on. Uh, there's a Zoro, 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 
Zoroastrian site as well, where it's believed Freddie Mercury is, but no one will say. It's supposed to be a secret. Necropolis, the city of the dead. What a name. Now, without trying to be morbid, we need to understand that all of us are on a train to the necropolis. All of us. There are branch lines everywhere, not just uh, in Waterloo, to a necropolis near you. In um, songs, you often get the idea of a slow train coming around the bend, which is a picture of death. In those old gospel songs, the slow train, there are other, there's a gospel train, which we'll get to, but the slow train, it's often pictured death coming round the bend. Now, you may be a first class, second class, third class uh, uh, person. You may have one of those tickets, but it doesn't really matter whether you're first class or third class. The slow train's coming round the bend and will take you to a necropolis. It doesn't matter whether you're Anglican or nonconformist or whether you're Zoroastrian or whether you're a Muslim or whatever you are, the slow train is coming round the bend and you will board it. Because in many ways, our planet is a necropolis. Everybody that's died is buried on the planet. No one's died outside of the planet. Everyone that's died even when they're slightly in the atmosphere, their dust comes down to earth. This world is a graveyard. The world is a necropolis, so you hardly need to get on a train. Your playground, your workplace, is your graveyard. It's chilling, isn't it? We're living in a necropolis. The whole world is a graveyard. And that is why we need to utterly and urgently listen to Jesus. There is no one else in the entire universe that you need to listen to. Utterly, urgently. Jesus is utterly relevant for you because you are playing in your graveyard. Or the slow train is coming round the bend. Jesus said, and uh, you can put these verses up in the next slide, in John chapter 5, before this event, he said, Very truly, I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. He's warned us (laughs) that the Son of God is going to speak. And dead people will live. He warned us in chapter 5 that's going to happen. And here we are now in chapter 11. Now, that's an amazing sentence, isn't it? In a graveyard world. Compare that with, say, the actor, the director, the comedian, Woody Allen. Woody Allen's very famous statement. We probably know it. And you'll certainly know it when I say. He said, I'm not a, it's not that I'm afraid to die. I just don't want to be around, around when it happens. That's what he, and and obviously not. But he explained that sentence in uh, an article in Esquire magazine entitled, Woody Allen Wipes the Smile Off His Face. He's a comedian. He writes this, Death is absolutely stupefyingly terrifying. And it renders anyone's accomplishments meaningless. It makes our lives look as irrelevant as the waves breaking on the seashore. To him, death is the end. To him is the final station. To him, you take the coffin off and leave it in the necropolis. Go no further. It's the end of the line. And you can't go any further. And therefore, if it's the end of the line, it makes everything you've ever done, everything you've ever said, everything you've ever achieved, totally meaningless. Because if it's the end of the line, then it's the end of the line. In John 11, Jesus turns things around. In John 5, he promises 
that death doesn't have to be the end of the line. In John 11, he shows us he can turn death to life. The story of Lazarus is interesting. He's with his disciples. Uh, In the end of chapter 10, his enemies have wanted to kill him. He's chatting with his disciples. Then comes the news that one of his best mates, Lazarus, is is dying. He hangs around for a couple of days and doesn't go immediately until Lazarus has dies. He talks about glorifying uh, himself. You'll see the glory of God in, in the death of, of Lazarus. And all kinds of things happen. And then in the end, he comes to the place, the necropolis, the place, the tomb, the place of death. He comes, he's coming into the village. And Martha comes out, a sister of Lazarus, and says, if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. And then Mary comes out, the sister of Lazarus, the other sister, as if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. And then Jesus comes to the place of the dead, as if he's coming off the train, as it were. And here's the first thing we see, and it's quite surprising. Jesus rages at death. He's furious. Look at verse 32, and then 38. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her, that's Mary, also weeping, he was, listen to the words, deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Then verse 38, Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Deeply moved and troubled. Once more deeply moved. Now that deeply moved means angry. So we were seeing something of Jesus' anger this morning. So there's a theme here, isn't there? He's moved to anger. But the word here is is a very graphic word. It's to do with horses. It's horses snorting in rage. It's like a war horse. And it's snorting. It's so furious. It's raging horse. So in one sense, if you want to you know, put that um, in sort of modern times, because this war horse, it'd be like a tank firing away or an Exocet missile coming down with an explosion or an aeroplane that's going to shoot. He's raging against death like a raging horse with indignant displeasure. And the word troubled there, is agitated. He's moving backwards and forwards. He's shaking to and fro, just like a horse. And he's just raging against this stuff. And backwards and forwards, raging. That's the words that are used. Jesus is raging against death. He hates it. He's screaming at it. At this point, it seems like he's with Woody Allen. Or or with Dylan Thomas, with that famous poem. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Don't go gently into the night. Don't go gently into death. Stop going gently into death. Rage, rage, rage against the dying of the light. Now, this isn't just empathy that Jesus has for the grieving sisters and the mourners. That he's filled with rage against death. He understands just what death does. He doesn't say death doesn't matter. He doesn't say, oh, well, we all die. He doesn't say death is nothing. He doesn't say, well, she was 96. She had a good innings. She nearly reached 100. He he doesn't say that. He doesn't say, well, she's gone, but someone else will take her place. It's no. This should not happen. Modern atheists... They try to convince us that death isn't important at all. Um, Brian Cox, he tries to tell us that, uh, you know, when you die, you turn to stardust, he says in his romantic way. But just putting star in front of dust doesn't make any difference. Dust is dust. You turn to dust. Steve Jobs, Apple, he said death is a... Is, a, a, is very likely the best invention of life. It's life's change. 
He, he sees it in an evolutionary, atheistic way, you see. that It's the survival of the fittest. You've got to get rid of the old. That's why there must be so many, you know, iPhones. iPhone 1, iPhone 2, iPhone 3, iPhone 4, iPhone 5, iPhone 6. Get rid of Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs 1, Steve Jobs 2, Steve Jobs 3. Let's get a better one, a fitter one. He's dead now. Hooray. Got rid of the old model. Now, it's all very well to talk like that in a lecture theatre. But when your loved one has died, you know what it's like. Don't you? Why, why do we spend billions trying to get rid of a little tiny virus? Why did we actually shut ourselves up for, you know, ages? Because we were scared of death. The atheist position, it's all right in a lecture theatre. It's not real at all, as the whole of their philosophy isn't. The Bible is much more nearer, much more accurate. The Bible states that death is an enemy and he's your enemy and he's hungry and he'll never be satisfied until all men and women and boys and girls and children enter in. Death destroys and Jesus sees that and he rages. He's moved deeply, deeply moved. And trouble. Just see what death has done. In this story, here's Lazarus. He's much loved, isn't he? Clearly. I mean, we're told twice that Jesus loved Lazarus. And obviously the sisters loved Lazarus. And I guess other people loved Lazarus. And people at least had respect for him because they were coming from Jerusalem to the, to the funeral and pay their respects. And they were crying and so forth. So there's, there's love for Lazarus. But what does Lazarus do? What does Lazarus, where does he have to be? They love him, but they can't be near him. He stinks. They love him, but they have to separate from him. They love him, but they have to wrap him up in the grave clothes and put him in a tomb. And when Jesus shockingly comes to the tomb and says, roll the stone away, Martha, the sister, is clearly saying, we can't be near him. We love Lazarus, but we can't be anywhere near him. You can't open up the tomb. We don't want to be near him. She says in verse 38, by this time there's a bad odour, for he's been there for four days. Four days in a hot country in a tomb. I mean, the, the old translation is actually much nearer the original Greek which says, Lord, by this time he stinketh. He's, he stinks. It's not just a bad odor. He stinks. He's been rotting for four days. Where his eyes were, there is pools of liquid. He stinks. He's not only dead, he's rotten. And even loving sisters can't abide to be near him. Even those who love him have to put him away and seal him up and lock him up. He's revolting. It's nauseous to be around the loved one. The one we love, we have to be separated from. Because death putrefies him. He stinks. And that's what death does. Death separates us from our loved ones. Steve Jobs and Brian Cox. How foolish. How empty. Is atheism. Jesus sees it. And he's angry. We need to stop saying death is nothing. We ought to be outraged. Death is a big, big, big problem. War isn't our problem. <laughs> Pandemic isn't our problem. Disease isn't our problem. No one dies because of wars. Or not any more people die because of a war or a disease or a pandemic that isn't going to die anyway. Death is our issue. It's the big issue. So he rages. But there's a second thing. Jesus has a deeper rage here. I hope you see this. See, death says that there is something very, very wrong with the world. It separates even those we love. We have to separate from the dead. That's why we have necropolises out in the Surrey hillsides. The New Testament, though, the Bible, 
describes two types of deaths. A deeper rage here that Jesus has, I think, against this second death. There's the physical death. We see that in the example of Lazarus, the physical death. It separates us from physical life. It separates us from those that we love. But the New Testament says that there is another kind of death, a bit more subtle. Uh, We need to think a bit harder to see it, but it's a spiritual death. And because of the spiritual death, we have physical death. It's that way round. A spiritual death. And that separates us. As physical death separates us from loved ones, spiritual death separates us from the God of love. We were made to walk out into the world, a world of abundant life and growth. If you read the creation account in the Bible, it's, it's beautiful. It's a world full of life, so much life. There's life in the sea, there's life in the air, there's life on the ground. There's life that gives birth to life. It's a constant Life gives birth to life that gives birth to life. It's extraordinary. Plants full of seeds that produce new plants, new life. It's an amazing thing. I don't know whether you know anything about an aphid or black fly or green fly. Do you know anything about them? You, you, you're, you're, if, you, if you grow anything, you'll see a plant and there's, there might be one aphid on it, one black fly or one green fly. They're tiny, tiny little things and they're usually at the end uh, of your plant where where there's nice succulent stuff you'll see one you go away and you come back the next day and you think how did that happen there's a billion of them yeah well they give life to life so they can give birth to a baby that's already pregnant isn't that extraordinary the baby is pregnant so they give birth to a baby that gives birth to a baby that's how they grow That's the sort of life that you get in this world that that God creates. It's life upon life upon life upon life. There's no shadow of death. There's no graveyard in in, uh, the Garden of Eden. There's a world where the God of life and light and love and joy and beauty stands back and says, It is good. It is good. And then men and women are brought into this world to go out into God's world, to do God's work under God's word, to bring life, to bring life, to bring life and growth and life. There's no entropy here. No running down like batteries run down. You know, that's entropy. Everything's running. There's no innings, you know, where you get to 96 and you're out. You should have got to 100. It's none of that. There's no reaching your full potential. Because you'll never reach it. Because there's always more to have and more to give and more to receive. There's no dying. There's no running out. There's more, more, more. Like aphids. That's the world God made. And God gave Adam and Eve this place in this world of life. And he created them alive physically And alive spiritually. They were made for life and light and love and joy and beauty. And God says when he made them, they're very good. The God of life said, they're really good. They were made to walk with God and talk with God. They were made to love God and be loved by God. But... Death came. Divorce. Separation. Spiritual first. Walking out on the life giver. You walk out on the life giver and where where are you? In the land of the dead. Spiritual death. Thinking we don't need the life giver. Separating from the life giver. And along with spiritual death comes physical death, dragged into this world. The Bible says our sin has separated us from God. We can't hear him. We can't see him. We can't know him. We're in a tomb that stinks. And even though he loves us, how can he come near us? Spiritually, rotten to the core. 
sin severs relationship with God who made us. Sin severs us from the God of life. And if you're severed from the God of life and love and joy and peace, you're in the land of the dead, the necropolis world, the graveyard world, now just waiting for physical death to finish it all off. On the platform, waiting for the slow train to come to take you, to bury you in the world that was your playground. Physical death, you see, causes Jesus rage because it's a picture of spiritual death. And even loved ones come, can't come near the rotting <coughs> spiritual stink. Look at Ephesians. This is a book in the Bible. He's writing to Christians and he says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. You were dead. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the rulers of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us. Also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and knowing its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were nature, uh, by nature deserving wrath, deserving God's anger. We're dead. The whole world is a graveyard, but the whole world is full of spiritually dead people just waiting for the physical to end it all. So we have limited time. If physical death happens before spiritual death has been solved, then you will remain separated from God of life forever. That's what the Bible says. It's a one-way trip to the necropolis. Now, without understanding this, we'll never understand why Jesus came into the world. The wages of sin is death. The sting of death is sin. Sin, breaking away from God, has poisoned us. And it's killing us physically. As it killed us spiritually. The wages of sin is death. That's what we've earned. So the ticket onto the slow train is free. You've already earned your price. You don't have to pay. You don't have to pay the ferryman. You don't have to pay the bloke on the station. Oh, yes, you've paid. Tickets? Oh, no, no need for that. You've paid. Sinner, on you go. The slow train's coming, and it's coming round the bend to the necropolis. There's a one-way ticket. Unless sin has been dealt with. Look at the hope in this verse here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in the Bible. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, because the law of God condemns us. It shows us that we're sinners. You've broken God's law. But thanks be to God, he gives us victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that would be something to hear as you're on the slow train going to the necropolis, wouldn't it? If suddenly the guard said, ladies and gentlemen, uh, just this, you're on your train, you're on your slow train to the necropolis, London necropolis, next station. Uh, I've got a little line here somewhere, don't know, uh, you know, if you paid your price, it doesn't matter if you're first class, second class, third class, ladies and gentlemen, but hey, There's this little sentence here, thanks be to God who gives us victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Anybody interested? If we go out out of your seat, where's the God? Where's the God? I've got tickets here uh, to get off this train onto another one. Where's the God? Yeah? So in this story, Jesus comes to the tomb of Lazarus. He's angry at what, what death does. Spiritual death physical death and he weeps that's the third thing I want you to see Jesus weeps look at verse 35 
Jesus wept. Jesus stood face to face with the last enemy, death. He saw what sin had done and he's angry. He sees that it's destroying the life of God and rotting the work of God, both physically and spiritually. And he's angry, but he's not only angry, he weeps. It's extraordinary, this, isn't it? Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the entire Bible. Two words. Jesus wept. It's such a powerful little verse full of pathos. You can't add, can you? You couldn't add a word. You could not add a single word to that verse to make it better. Jesus wept. Man of sorrow, full of grief. Jesus wept. When he sees your condition, Jesus weeps. He's not skipping around. It's not like I told you so. He's not just angry at death. He sees what it does and he weeps and he weeps. It's quite a strong word. He weeps, strongly weeps. Oh, the horror of sin and death. He felt it. Death hurts everyone and it hurts Jesus. And can it be that thou, my God, should cry for me? Isn't that amazing? Steve Jobs doesn't obviously weep. Brian Cox certainly doesn't weep for you. Atheism doesn't care. Jesus weeps. But that's not enough. That's not enough. Here's my fourth point. Jesus calls. Jesus calls. Now look at the story. Verse 38. Let's read a bit. Jesus once more deeply moved. There it is. Came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odour, for he's been dead four days. He stinketh. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. I mean, there must have been quite a lot of discussion on that. And then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. He's praying to God. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Lord, will will these people believe? This is what the whole book of John is about. Will these people believe? When he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. His hands and his feet wrapped with strips of linen, And a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. (laughs) Poor bloke, he's got life in him and he's still got these things on. He's probably falling over. Jesus calls. Actually, he roars. It's a mega voice. That's what the word means. It means mega voice. He roars like the Lion of Judah. He roars out. And an, an immovable object meets an irresistible force. That's what's going on here. Death, an immovable object. He's dead. Yeah? How can he even hear the command? But the voice of Jesus breaks into this dead man somehow. And when Jesus meets death, he wins. Verse 43, Jesus called him out. Verse 44, Lazarus comes out. And as every preacher says when they preach this verse, he had to say Lazarus, otherwise everybody would have come out of the grave. (laughs) He names him. He knows his name. The crowd had been grieving for four days. Jesus comes along, and in one minute, he's alive. No one in history. This is why Jesus is right. No No one has this authority. Do they? See, this is the trouble, isn't it? When people say, oh, you Christians, you're so sort of... It's sort of nasty to say that Jesus is better than Muhammad. Well, can Muhammad do this? You know, I don't want to be rude to Muhammad, but he can't do this. So why would I listen to Muhammad when Jesus can do this? If someone can raise the dead, he's worth listening to, isn't he? So Jesus is shown that he can command a decomposed body. And he comes out of the tomb. 
Remember those words in chapter 5? Very truly I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear it will live. So what does this say Jesus is? He's the Son of God. Muhammad denies that he's the Son of God. So he's wrong on lots of for reasons. This proves he is the Son of God. Because when the Son of God speaks, the dead hear. The dead hear. How can the dead hear? But they do. Now, listen, you mustn't leave this stuff as a massive, amazing historical event. It's not here for you to say, oh, isn't he marvelous? Isn't he great? Let's sing a song about him. It's not here for that only. Jesus is coming to call you out of the necropolis. He's calling you out of the tomb to live. Have you heard the voice of Jesus say, come, your name? I'm not talking about whether you're religious and go to church. Have you heard your name? Have you heard Jesus call you to make you spiritually alive? Have you come out of the grave? Because if your spiritual position isn't sorted out before you physically die, then you're going to stay in the one-way ticket to the necropolis. Have you come out of the grave? Is there a before and after in your life? There's a slow train coming, coming round the bend. and We'll take you to the necropolis, which is already here, your playground. But there's another train in good old songs, the gospel train. Get on board the gospel train. The gospel train is thundering along. And the gospel train, Jesus, will take you through the necropolis, but out the other side. This gospel train busts through the necropolis. It has another station to glory. The slow train stops there. The gospel train pushes through. You go through death into resurrection. And that's the issue that Jesus is dealing with. Have a look at Jesus' conversation here with Martha in 21 to 27. Now, next week, we'll come back to this, I hope. But let's just have a quick look at it. Verses 21 to 27. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. See, anyway, there's lots of stuff there. Uh, (laughs) But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So she knows that there is a resurrection day. She knows that there's a physical, spiritual resurrection. She knows this. Some people say the Old Testament people didn't know that. She did, so therefore they did. Um, And so she knows that there's a resurrection day, a day where, you know, you're put right and you're with God. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection day. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. Listen, they live. We go through the the, the, the necropolis city, but whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she said. She replied, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who's come into the world. He's come into the world to be the resurrection day. You don't have to wait for spiritual resurrection. You can be resurrected now because Jesus has come to the graveyard world. That's why he come. The Messiah, the Son of God, has come into a graveyard world to say, I will sort your future out. Together we'll go through death, but you won't die. We'll whiz through that station into resurrection life. Get on the board the gospel train, Jesus is saying. Although there weren't trains in those days. But that's what he is saying. Very truly I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those uh, uh, who hear it will live. And Jesus demonstrates this. I am the resurrection and the life. And I demonstrate it by physically raising Lazarus. But you can know spiritual resurrection now. Get on the gospel train and we'll whiz through the necropolis quick. Necropolis quick. 
That's what he's saying. Do you believe this? Look, I'll prove you. I'll do the physical to show you I can do the spiritual. Yeah? I'll resuscitate him. I'll show you I have power over rotting flesh. And so come to me now. Get on the gospel train. And together, we'll go through the necropolis into glory. But I have a last point. Nearly done. It's the before and after I was taken up with this week. The before and after. The transformation of Lazarus from death to life. It's marvelous, isn't it? Isn't it? It just struck me. You know those before and after photos, you know. Uh, Have you got a bald head? And then there's a picture of a bloke with a massive bald head, isn't there? And then you see the next picture. And you can't, is it really the same bloke? And he's got a full head of hair, you know. It's like that. Or, are you fat? And then there's this whopping fatty there. And all of the fat is coming out. And then, you know, six weeks on this program. And then he, oh, my goodness, how did he get those? You know, how did he look like that? Is it the same bloke? It's a massive difference before and after, isn't it? Or you've got... Weak little weakling, he's on the beach and he's weak and he's pasty and, and then 12 weeks on this program and there's muscles coming out. Uh, you know, even his earlobes have got muscles on them. It's phenomenal. And you think, I need that, I need that. I'm bald, I want to get that cream. I'm fat, I need to get that pill. I'm weak, I need to do that, you know, buy that machine and it will sort me out. And the, the before and after photos. Well, imagine the before and after photos of Lazarus. A decomposing, stinking, rotting body before. Now take the grave clothes off. A healthy man. It's amazing, isn't it? And Jesus did that. And he did that physically to show what happens spiritually. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, If anyone is in Christ, that's Jesus, The new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. It's here. Resurrection days started here. When you're spiritually resurrected, resurrection days already started here. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. Think of the transformation. Think of the before and after. Bald head, head of hair. Fat belly, wow. Yeah? Life without Jesus, death. Life with Jesus, hears the voice of God. Life without Jesus, dead. Life with Jesus, born again. Life without Jesus, your father is the devil. Life with Jesus, your father is God. Life without Jesus, there's works of the flesh, there's sin going on. Life with Jesus, the fruit of the Spirit is beginning to grow. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, patience. Life without Jesus, the before photo, hell. Life with Jesus, heaven. Before eternal death. After eternal life, before hungry, after the bread of life, before thirsty, after the water of life, before alone, after in the family of God and in the family of God, uh, uh, in, in the family of the church, before outer darkness, after light of life, without Jesus Your resurrection body will be the decaying, rotten thing that you have now. With Jesus, a new body, a resurrection body. Amazing, isn't it? Before and after. And Jesus has come. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live. Even though they die. Even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Get on the gospel train. Come to Jesus. Travel through the necropolis. That's what it seems to 
happened with the queen? She's been dead for four days. Four days she's been dead. Where is she? She's not in the funny angel skipping through the thing with, with her husband. She's not gazing at her husband. Poor old King Charles III got that wrong. She's gazing at Jesus. Yeah. The Jesus that she seemed to know and talk about a lot. Four days, Jesus comes to her tomb and she's resurrected. She's alive, waiting for a new body. That old frail body that met that prime minister. No wonder she died. Uh, but uh, that old frail body that met another prime minister. And it, you could see she, that body, that body is decaying, isn't it? One day we'll be so alive, so rich, so beautiful. Have you got on the gospel train? Have you come to the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you trusted in him? Do you believe? And if you don't believe, why on earth wouldn't you? Have you asked him? Have you heard him saying to you, even tonight, come? Don't rot. Come. Be resurrected spiritually so that you will know a resurrection physically in the new creation. Will you come to him? Let's just have a think. What are you going to do? Has he spoken to you tonight? And is it time you got on the train and said, I'm coming, Lord Jesus. I'm coming out of the grave. I'm coming out of living for self. I'm coming to live for God.